Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today we bring you the story of the 1936 Berlin Olympic Basketball Tournament. In 1936, that was the first year that basketball was included as a full medal sport. Now, it was not the first time that basketball was played at the Olympics, just the first time that it was a full permanent medal sport. Back in 1904, the Olympics were hosted in St. Louis, Missouri, in the United States. Since America was the host of the Olympics, they decided to have basketball as a demonstration sport, which was the privilege afforded to the host nation. Or at least it was afforded to them until 1992, when the International Olympic Committee put an end to it. But basically, this is how it worked. The host nation would use the opportunity to include a sport that was very specific or had its origins in that culture or nation. The demonstration sport did offer medals, like every other sport did, but the medals would not count toward a nation's official totals. Occasionally, a demonstration sport became popular enough to become a full medal sport, as in this case. For example, Sweden hosted the 1912 Olympics and decided to include a sport called glima, which was traditional Icelandic wrestling. It did not become a full medal sport. But America introduced baseball to the Olympic schedule in 1984 when the games were hosted in Los Angeles. That time, the game did become a full medal sport, at least for a while. In 1904, the American Olympic Committee decided to display basketball, the fun new game that was just invented 13 years earlier, but which had already become incredibly popular. The committee decided to take the opportunity to help the sport grow and become popular internationally. No better way to do that than to play in front of an international audience. Remember, this is 1904. The Olympics were not broadcast on international television. If someone wanted to see the Olympics, they had to travel to St. Louis that year to watch it in person. In St. Louis, the Olympic Committee decided to demonstrate basketball in three divisions, high school, college, and professional. All of the teams were American since hardly anyone played outside of the United States. The winner of the pro division was one of the legendary barnstorming teams of the early 1900s, the Buffalo Germans from Buffalo, New York. And I'm sure I'll do a story about this team at some point in the future, because the Germans were really one of the very first nationally known teams. But back in the Olympics, the game was a hit. With the help of the international YMCA locations, they continued to promote the game worldwide. The game started to grow to the point where it was included again at the Olympics as a demonstration sport in Paris in 1924, in Amsterdam in 1928, and in 1932 when America hosted again in Los Angeles. At that point, the IOC decided to make basketball a full medal sport for the 1936 games in Berlin. So the U.S. Olympic Committee has to put together a proper team now that basketball was an official sport. I covered this part in a previous episode about how the basketball team was selected. I mentioned it in episode 37 on Adolf Rupp and again in episode 43 on Don Barksdale, but I will give you the short version here. The U.S. Olympic Committee invited eight amateur teams for the Olympic tournament. The five starters from the team that wins the tournament and the five starters from the team that takes second place automatically get the first 10 spots on the team. The remaining four spots on the team were given to the next four best players regardless of which team they were on. Also. The winning coach of the tournament becomes the head coach of the Olympic team, and the coach of the second place team becomes the assistant coach of the Olympic team. The eight teams that were invited to the tournament were the Globe Refiners and the Universals, both of which were AAU teams. Also invited were the Wilmerding YMCA team from Wilmerding, Pennsylvania. 
The remaining five teams were all college teams, including the University of Arkansas, University of Washington, Utah State University, DePaul University, and Temple University. That year, the team that won the tournament was the Globe Refiners from McPherson, Kansas. They were one of the AAU teams that was named after their primary sponsor, the Globe Oil Refinery, which produced gasoline. The second place team was the Universals from Los Angeles, the other AAU team that was sponsored by Universal Pictures in Hollywood. All of these AAU players were employees of the sponsoring companies. The last four players taken were the next four best in the tournament, and it turned out that the last four spots were given to one more member of the Globe Refiners and two more members of the Universals. The last spot went to Ralph Bishop from the University of Washington. Now that the team was formed, it was time to practice together, raise some money for the trip to Berlin, and then get ready to go. On July 15, 1936, the entire U.S. Olympic team, representing every sport, boarded a ship that left Pier 60 in New York City bound for Europe. One of the players on the basketball team was Sam Balter from the Universals team. At first, he was not sure that he should even go. He had hesitations because he was Jewish. The Olympics were being held in Germany where Adolf Hitler was in charge. But after reconsidering the issue, he decided what better thing to do than to go to Berlin and make Adolf Hitler watch a Jewish man win the gold medal. This is where I have to pause the main story to add some context. Often when I share these basketball stories, my goal is to share a story from basketball's history that has some significance to the overall history or development of the game. In this case, it is practically impossible to tell this story without acknowledging the fact of where the tournament was being played. It was being played in Nazi Germany. Adolf Hitler had been in charge for about three years at the time of the Olympics and World War II was not going to start for about three more years after the Olympics. But in the meantime, Hitler was working furiously to rebuild Germany and build up his military in preparation to begin the war. When athletes from around the world arrived in Berlin, they were greeted with Nazi flags and swastikas everywhere. They noticed Nazi soldiers posted on practically every corner in a variety of different colors and styles indicating the type of soldier they were. This was Hitler's opportunity to show off to the entire international community how he had rebuilt Germany from a country with practically a non-existent economy still reeling from the sanctions of World War I into an international powerhouse. In other words, this was a chance for Hitler to show off in front of the entire world. This was Hitler's opportunity to turn the Olympics into his own personal propaganda machine. They spent months preparing the city of Berlin for everyone's arrival. They repaved roads, repainted and repaired buildings. They put a fresh coat of paint on everything. They made sure that every storefront was filled with goods. They wanted to give off the impression of abundance. But most of it was just an act. It was just temporary. Most of the stores would close as soon as the Olympics were over. All resources and effort would be redirected back to building up the military. Even while the Olympics were going on, there were war camps outside of Berlin already forcing Jews into slave labor. And German Jews that were not already in jail were not allowed anywhere near any of the Olympic venues. Hitler even excluded Jewish athletes from his own German Olympic team. The American basketball players who were selected from the Universals team knew that something was up. These players worked on movie sets in Hollywood for a living and they all said that Berlin was cleaner than a movie set. And that is what did not feel right about it. It was just too perfect, like it was all some sort of elaborate staging. And they were dead right. At this point in their Nazi history, it was no secret that Hitler was promoting the white race as superior. This was a point where many of the international athletes of color, or of Jewish background, had to think twice before deciding to represent their countries in Berlin. Guys like Sam Balter. Thankfully, most of these athletes decided that they needed to go, if for no other reason than to show Hitler that his theory of Aryan superiority was nothing but propaganda. So this is the background for all the athletes as the American basketball team was preparing to win gold in Berlin. It did not get any better when they got there. The 1936 Olympics were the first ones that did a huge proper opening ceremony the way that we see it today. The Nazis wanted to go over the top and show the rest of the world how great they thought they were with bands and marching and more Nazi flags than anyone could count. Even the Hindenburg flew over the stadium as part of the ceremony. One of two traditions that kept going from that Olympics was the pomp and circumstance of the opening ceremonies. The other tradition was that of bringing the Olympic flame from Athens, Greece to the opening ceremony. Yep, 
That was their idea too. As part of every opening ceremony, there is the Parade of Nations, where each country marches around the track. Every country was instructed to have their flag bearer dip their flag as they marched directly in front of Hitler as a sign of respect for the Nazi regime and the Fuhrer. American gymnast Al Jochim was carrying the American flag and he refused to dip that American flag when they came around in front of Hitler and the gesture spoke loudly. Hitler noticed. And this is a good place to stop and take a break and I'll be right back with the story of the actual tournament. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Welcome back to the show, and let us pick up where we left off. The basketball team is getting ready to play in this tournament. There are 21 nations represented in the basketball tournament, and they had to play on a series of outdoor clay courts like the ones you see at the French Open tennis tournament. And it rained some, but that did not stop the tournament. They just played in the rain and mud. One of the unusual rules for basketball at that Olympics was the fact that once you substituted a player out of the game, he could not re-enter. They treated it like it was international football or soccer as we call it in the US. That meant that the five starters typically played the whole game. Also, Germany provided the official balls for the tournament, which were oversized, completely smooth, and very slippery, especially on the days when it rained. At the time, there was no official standard for what a basketball should be. So the Germans decided to design their own version, and they made everyone play with it. James Naismith was able to make it to the Olympics when various groups raised money to send him and his wife to Berlin to see the game he invented played for a gold medal. However, his wife caught ill and he was not able to travel with him, so he had to travel alone. But you figured that the guy who invented the game would have been given some special honor or recognition. But the Nazis really did not care about him, so it all fell through the cracks. When Nate Smith showed up on the first day of competition, he went straight to Will Call expecting to have a ticket waiting for him. But the ticket office had no idea who he was. It was really embarrassing. Thankfully, someone from the U.S. committee realized what had happened and pulled some strings to make sure that a seat was available for Nate Smith for every game of the tournament. And Nate Smith took it all in. He attended every single game of basketball at that Olympics. As a side note, 17 of the 21 head coaches had studied basketball at the YMCA in Springfield, Massachusetts, where the game was invented. They either studied with Naismith or with one of his former students. Many of these coaches knew each other and knew Naismith. It was like a little reunion. The first game of the tournament was between France and Estonia, and Naismith was brought out to perform a ceremonial tip-off. It was a great start to the competition. The American team had been practicing at 9 a.m. each morning in the Olympic Village in preparation for the tournament. So when they showed up for their first game against Spain, the Spaniards were nowhere to be found. The Spanish Civil War had broken out and the team had to fly home to fight in it. The Americans won their first game by forfeit. And if anything, that is a life lesson about how someone can do everything within their power to prepare for something, and yet there is still some things that are just out of anyone's control. For those Spanish players, their country was at war with itself, which they had nothing to do with, but they had to be there to help. The other odd thing about the tournament is that each team could only suit up seven players for games. It was a really unusual rule and there really is no good reason for it. So head coach Jimmy Needles divided his team into two seven-man squads and they would take turns playing every other game. One squad included all seven players from the Universals. The other squad included the six players from the Globe Refiners and the one player from Washington. The Americans played their second game against Estonia and routed them 52-28. to The Estonians used an unusual strategy of having one player stay on the offensive end to cherry pick, while the rest of the Estonian team played 4 against 5. The Americans took advantage and scored easily. The Americans then had a bye for their third game, which means that they qualified for the elimination round having played only one game, but officially they had three victories against zero losses. In the quarterfinals, the Americans easily defeated the Philippines when the American defense dominated the second half. That game was played by the Globe Refiner squad, meaning that the Universal squad would play the semifinals. And the semifinals matched the Americans against Mexico, where the Americans won 25 to 10. The Universals did their job and put the American team into the gold medal game. But then it dawned on the Universal's players that even though they won the semifinal match, 
they would not play in the gold medal game because it was the Globe Refiner's turn to play. The Universal players begged the coach, which was their own coach from the Universal's team, to let the Universal's players play two games in a row and win that gold medal. The coach stuck to his rotation and said that the Globe Refiner's players would play that gold medal game. That game pitted the Americans against Canada, and Naismith could not be happier. It was the country of his birth against the country of his choice. When the team showed up for the gold medal game, they found the court under two inches of water since it had been raining the entire night before. Even the organizers agreed that they could not use that court. They moved the game to one of the other courts that was in slightly better condition. As everyone walked over to the other court, they walked past Mexico and Poland playing for the bronze medal. They were basically playing in mud. Dribbling was not going to work, so they had to resort to moving the ball with passing only. The same was true in the gold medal game as rain began to pour soon after the game started. Back then they had a rule that after every made basket there would be a tip off at center court. The Americans had a player that stood 6 foot 8, Joe Fortenberry, who won every tip which allowed the Americans to keep the ball for multiple possessions in a row. When the Canadians did get the ball, Fortenberry ran back on defense and goaltended every basket. Goaltending was still allowed in those days. The Canadians basically had no chance. The final score was 19 to 8 as the game was played in wet, sloshy weather with a slippery ball and on a slippery, muddy court. It was the weirdest, worst, and best game all at the same time. The players fought hard against the conditions of nature. The Germans actually had an indoor facility that they could have used for the gold medal game, but they were stubborn and refused to let the teams use it. They said that if soccer could be played outside, then so could basketball, even in the rain. In the end, North America dominated with America, Canada, and Mexico taking gold, silver, and bronze respectively. And Naismith had an incredible time over the two weeks. He took time to try to get to know as many players as he could from all 21 nations. He was always a humble man, but it delighted him greatly to see his game played at the Olympics. He was on cloud nine as he returned to America. America has now won 15 out of 19 Olympics where basketball was played. And in case you're wondering, the Soviet Union has won it twice, then Yugoslavia and Argentina each have won. And I just want to finish by naming the players who were part of that team. From the University of Washington, we have Ralph Bishop. From the Globe Refiners, we have Joe Fortenberry, Tex Gibbons, Francis Johnson, Jack Ragland, Willard Schmidt, and Bill Wheatley. And from the Universals team, we have Sam Balter, Carl Knowles, Frank Lubin, Art Molnar, Donald Piper, Carl Shy, and Dwayne Swanson. As for Sam Balter, America's only Jewish basketball player that year, he was one of America's top scorers at the Olympics, and he later became a well-known radio voice in Los Angeles. The head coach, Jimmy Needles, later became the athletic director at the University of San Francisco when they recruited Bill Russell and Casey Jones and won two national championships. Frank Lubin went on to live in his ancestral home of Lithuania, where he taught basketball and coached the national team to European championships. Many of the players that he coached later became coaches in the Soviet Union during the 1970s and 1980s, when they were considered the second best team in the world after America. So in a way, we can blame Lubin for the Soviets winning the gold medal in 1972 when the games returned to Germany. He taught those Soviet coaches the game of basketball. Now how's that for irony? Well, that's our story for today. I want to give a shout out to author Andrew Marinus as his book, Games of Deception, were my primary source of research on this story. Come back next week when we profile Hall of Famer Hal Greer, one of the early stars of the NBA and one of the 50 greatest players in NBA history. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. Also, go ahead and give us a rating and a review, and that will help others to find this podcast more easily. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon.
that year, and now he was also an NBA champion and the NBA Finals MVP. As was his nature, he spent the summer hunting and fishing back in Louisiana. It was his favorite thing to do. The one thing that the people of Bernice, Louisiana said was that no matter what, Willis Reed was the same old guy that grew up in their small town. He never changed, even after becoming a famous basketball player. He was still that hard-working kid at heart. The Knicks were able to win it again in 1973 when they added Earl Monroe to the team. And today, those are still the only two championships in Knicks history. Willis Reed played his final season in 1974 where he only made it into 19 games due to injury. His body had completely fallen apart after only 10 seasons. He was one of the most decorated players of all time and he was inducted into the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame in 1982 and was named to the NBA 75 list in 2021. He was a league MVP, an all-star MVP, an all-defensive player, and the only Nick in history to win finals MVP. Today, Willis Reed is comfortably retired in Grambling, Louisiana, not far from where he went to college. He lives in a very nice home right next to his best friend from childhood, Howard Brown. He still does chores around his property, but always looks forward to a day of hunting or fishing. Not a bad life if you ask me. The guy that everyone underestimated, even the Knicks, turned out to be arguably the greatest Nick of all time. Now no disrespect to Patrick Ewing, Bernard King, Carmelo Anthony, or anyone else who ever put on a Knicks jersey. But has anyone else been the captain and leader of a Knicks championship team? The answer is no. So that does it. On this story on Willis Reed, join us next week when we share the story of the friendship and rivalry between Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Will Chamberlain. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. Also, go ahead and give us a rating and a review, and that will help others to find this podcast more easily. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts, as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. And I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.